I'd say more his reaction to that Manchester City equaliser would show that he's under pressure than perhaps his comments. I think his comments are, you know, maybe he is trying to G the players up and say, look, you know, we're, we're brave and we're plucky and we only came away for a 3-1 defeat today. And yeah, in history, you know, you kind of look back and go, oh, it was only 3-1. But actually, you know, we know that, as you said there, there was every chance that on another day, Manchester City rack up maybe five or six goals instead. And it looks a hell of a lot different. And we're talking about a hell of a lot of different things this morning instead. It's been a crazy weekend of Premier League football, but I think the Manchester derby on Sunday afternoon is the only place for us to begin this discussion. But I'll start with a simple one for you, Ned, this morning. Was it a fair result? I think in the end of it, all things considered, uh, yes, <laughs> in, a, in a one word answer. Um, you look at the stats from it and I think, you know, the, the, the big standout one is the fact that Man City had more shots than Manchester United had the percentage of possession. I think Manchester City had 27 shots and Manchester United only had 26% possession. Now, of course, that's not to say that, you know, a rear guard defensive display is is anything to be, you know, looked at disparagingly and, you know, oh, because you don't have as much of the ball, you don't deserve to win the game. That's not what I'm saying at all. But in terms of teams that showed intact and intent, I think we saw more from Manchester City than we did Man United. Now, again, I'm not suggesting that Man United should have gone out all gung-ho because, you know, that probably would have left them a lot more exposed and we wouldn't be talking about a 3-1 defeat. We'd probably be talking about a 7-0 defeat instead. Um, but I think on the balance of play and all things considered, Manchester City were the better side throughout, better players as well. Um, you know, Marcus Rashford and Phil Foden both scoring fantastic goals, but Phil Foden had a great game for Manchester City and arguably Marcus Rashford didn't have a great afternoon for Man United, that goal aside. You know, I saw someone, uh, one of our colleagues at the Daily Star, Nick Murphy, posting on um, on, on X yesterday about it, on, on Sunday about it, saying that Marcus Rashford is, uh, you know, scoring an all-time Manchester derby great goal and delivering an all-time stinking Manchester derby performance is something akin to football heritage, I think is what Nick said, and I, I think he's right there. But again, that probably sums it up. A great moment of brilliance for Man United to be in the lead, to hold that lead to half-time, but actually, all told, Phil Foden's performance, Manchester City's performance was more deserving uh, of the three points. And yes, in short, it was a fair result, I believe. Do you think Manchester United come out with any credit from the result? Because I think there was a lot of talk. I mean, on our Thursday show, Andy Dunn sort of suggested that it could be a slaughtering for them in the game. But they came out, they were structured. I don't think Eric Ten Hag can be blamed in the way that they were set up because I think Manchester United set up in the correct way. They had a game plan and I think they largely executed that game plan but were undone essentially because Man City have, you know, top tier world class players and Manchester United probably don't. Yeah, that sums it up. I think you look at the benches as well and who could Manchester City bring on to change the game and who Man United could and, and it kind of highlighted the job that Dan Ashworth, when he eventually takes over as a sporting director or in that kind of structure at Man United, kind of a, a job similar to that, even if it's not going to be that exact job title, um, the job that he's got on his hands to rebuild that Manchester United squad because, you know, even in that starting eleven. Scott McTominay would not walk into that Manchester City. He wouldn't even get on the Manchester City bench, I think. You know, he's he's a good squad player for Manchester United, or he should be, at least, where, where Manchester United want to try and build. But he shouldn't be starting Derby. You shouldn't be looking at, you know, him and, and expecting him to be, you know, kind of one of your leading lights in a Derby. And, and likewise, you know, having to bring on Sofi and Amrabat off the bench as well. I mean, he's had an appalling season at Man United. I think he's just not really worked out for him at all. And it's a shame because we saw a, a great player at the World Cup and we thought, you know, Man United might have been where Casemiro is kind of moving towards the, the kind of latter stages of his career. Sofi and Amrabat might have been the uh, replacement for him, but I, I think he's probably likely to head back to Fiorentina come the summer. But again, it's there. It's, it's you know, who comes off the bench. For Man City, you know, Jeremy Dock, who's not having a great game, who can they bring on? They go and bring on World Cup winner Julian Alvarez instead, you know, and Alvarez has been phenomenal for City, especially in Erling Haaland's absence at times this season. And it's there, it, it highlights it, you know, as you said there, that was the difference in the end, the quality of players? It probably was, and it probably told. But again, it highlights that job that Dan Ashworth, when he eventually starts work at Man United, should he start work at Man United, and, and he probably will, um, the, the work that he's got to do in, you know, it's it's not necessarily even just the first team that he's got to worry about. It's that bench as well and who kind of comes on to be the replacements, to be your game changers when you need them. Uh, and Man City, I'm not saying that that turned the tide in their favour, but it definitely helps when you've got a World Cup winner to bring off the bench to replace somebody who maybe didn't have the best games in Doku. 
and this isn't going to be the first time we're going to talk about refereeing decisions today. Um, but Ten Hag kind of, I would say, clutching at straws a little bit, talking about a foul in the build-up to, I think it was City's first goal, where Rashford was kind of played in. And Kyle Walker, I would say, stepped across and won the ball fairly. But, you know, there's, a, I suppose, at least a discussion that there was possibly a foul in there. But do you think Ten Hag's clutching at straws a little bit mentioned that? Because it, it didn't, to me, look like a clear-cut foul. I was, I was watching Carl Walker's post-match interview on Sky Sports and I think he done very well to show great restraint and not say that when asked about this incident himself that Marcus Rashford needs to get on the weights a little bit more because that's that's all it was. Um, did Rashford play for it? Perhaps, you know, kind of... We've seen fouls like that given. We have, and it's frustrating. Um, you know, even Eric Ten Hag, I think, acknowledged in his post-match comments with Sky that it would have been soft had it been given. And yet he's arms flailing, screaming at the officials, saying that it should have been given and, and still kind of suggest that, oh, yes, it was soft, but it should have been a foul. And it's like, but if it was soft, it probably shouldn't have been a foul then. Um, no, I, I don't think there's anything in it. I don't think he's got much of a, you know, it, even himself, I think, by admitting it's soft, knows that he hasn't got much of an argument there. Uh, and yeah, 100% clutching at straws um, in, in that situation. You know, Kyle Walker defended it well, I think. You know, Marcus Rashford knew what he was doing. He felt contact. And, you know, like I said, we've seen that time and time again in the Premier League that, that things like that are given. But in this instance, I think the referee was right not to give uh, a foul for it and, and ultimately it led to uh, Manchester City's equaliser. Do you think the pressure is is maybe ramping up a little bit on Eric Ten Hag now? Because you know, even in his post-match, he'd said that the gap to Man City isn't that big. And I don't think anybody was watching that game. And we, we said at the start of the show that essentially Man City, uh, Man United played well and executed their game plan probably as well as they could have, and yet fell pretty short. And on a different day, Man City probably could have scored more goals. I mean, we see the Erlen Haaland miss from one yard out where he heads it over the ball, kicks it over the ball, I can't remember now, but he, he missed from one yard out. Um, to me, that just seemed like a nonsensical statement that, that the gap isn't that big because I think it's plain for all to see. I mean, look at the Premier League table. The gap between Manchester United and Man City is massive. I'd say more his reaction to that Manchester City equaliser would show that he's under pressure than perhaps his comments. I think his comments are, you know, maybe he is trying to G the players up and say, look, you know, we're, we're brave and we're plucky and we only came away for 3-1 defeat today. And yeah, in history, you know, you kind of look back and go, oh, it was only 3-1. But actually, you know, we know that, as you said there, there was every chance that on another day, Manchester City rack up maybe five or six goals instead. And it looks a hell of a lot different. And we're talking about a hell of a lot of different things this morning instead. Um, I, I think more so, you know, that kind of, we've never seen Eric Ten Hag that animated before on the touchline. And yet he's, you know, for a foul that he later then admittedly, knowingly acknowledges himself that was, you know, even he said it was soft. For him to be that animated over it, I think suggests more that the pressure is getting to him, that he's feeling under pressure. You know, a 1-0 win for United at Manchester City would have eased any pressure on him for probably between now and the end of the season, I would say that he would have had a strong chance then to, you know, kind of ridden this storm or come back to it in the summer. We can build again. There's something there to, to hang on to. And I think he was more upset that they were no longer in the lead. I think, you know, even, you know, anything would have happened at that point. I think his anger wasn't probably actually directed towards the foul. The anger was probably more directed towards the fact that they conceded, um, which again speaks of a man under pressure. Um, and, the form now as well to lose to Fulham last weekend, to need a, a late winner to beat Forest in the Cup in midweek uh, and to lose to Manchester City. You know, a couple of weeks back on the show, we we're talking about, oh yeah, Man United, they're the favourites to go out and, and finish in the top four. And, and now we're thinking they're going to face a bit of a struggle here. You know, it, it's been the same process with United throughout this season. One step forward, two, maybe three or four steps backwards. Consistently inconsistent is a term that I've used to sum up Manchester United before. Uh, and I think that pressure is starting to grow on Eric Ten Hag. And we saw that more in, in his reaction to Manchester City's equaliser than perhaps in his, his comments in the press conference. You know, with that, I think we have to remember that English isn't his first language. Maybe sometimes, you know, it can get lost a little bit in translation. So we'll, we'll give him a little bit of a free pass there. But definitely his reaction to that equaliser suggested a man under pressure. We've got to talk about Phil Foden, um, the star of the show again in the Manchester Derby. It's becoming his game, isn't it? You know, these are the, he's thriving. Um, so one, how good was his performance? But two, you know, Pep said that he was the the best player in the Premier League right now. Do you think he's 
possibly the, the shout right now to be the, the player of the year come the end of the season? And if not, who do you think has a better chance? Well, he's doing well, isn't he? He's already surpassed his um, great season last year. I think he's best in the Premier League uh, previously last year, wasn't it? Um, and he's already surpassed that. And we've still got two months of the campaign left to go. So he is having a phenomenal season. Um, he's enjoying more... You know, do we say it's more of a free role? I think for Manchester City, where he's kind of, you know, he's he's definitely playing more. Set, he's, he's played more centrally at times this year as well. And kind of yesterday, popped up on the right, popped up on the left. You know, was here, there, and everywhere for them. You know, I, I was speaking to a colleague um, last summer uh, who was suggesting, you know, Phil Foden. We talk about him as this generational talent, but what's he done? Where's he kicked onto? Is this the season now where we're starting to see him finally develop into that world class player that we all knew he was there, but. You know, the the kind of, I think my colleague's gripe with him at the time was he wasn't winning matches by himself. He did that in the derby yesterday and he's done that in a, in a couple of derbies before. So I think we're definitely seeing development in him. Um, for sure, a, a candidate for, for player of the season. Um, I think other players as well, you have to look at, you know, uh, Declan Rice has been great, I think, for Arsenal since he's gone in there. Um, you know, kind of really performed well. You know, other candidates as well that you might put forward for it were unfortunately, you know, kind of hamstrung a little bit by injuries. You know, James Madison, had he continued that form uh, that he showed at the start of his Tottenham career, had he not been out for two or three months, I'm sure we'd be having a conversation about James Madison as well. Um, you know, Kevin De Bruyne is always a regular um, in, in the conversation, even if he has been out so long um, uh, and for much of the season. You know, I'm sure we'll, we'll still maybe talking about him come the end of the campaign. But yeah, I think definitely I'll agree with uh, Phil Foden being in the running. Um, but of course, you know, does it? <laughs> there's still two months to go in a campaign. You know, it'd feel weird to give it to Phil Foden almost in a way if Liverpool were to go and win the title or Arsenal were to go and win the title. Um, so I think there's definitely still a long way to go, not just in the title race, but in the race to be, uh, you know, Premier League player of the season. And there's definitely plenty of good candidates on there. And, and the good thing ahead of a Euros this summer is that I'm talking about Phil Foden and talking about Declan Rice uh, as two players that could be considered leading lights for this. I'm sure Gareth Southgate would be delighted to see two of his key men for England in the running for that as well. Thank <laughs> you.